Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the 2022 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Jen Whaley, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our panel today, The Power of Athletics on Society, 50 Years of Title IX Impact and the Path Forward, presented by Wasserman. Our panelists today are the United States Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, the Massachusetts Attorney General, Maura Healy, point guard for the Seattle Storm, Sue Bird, American artistic gymnast, Lori Hernandez. And our panel will be moderated by Shira Springer, journalist and lecturer at Boston University and MIT Sloan. This panel will run for one hour. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Shira. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you to the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. And thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to talk about Title IX since it's an area of passion for me. Having participated in college athletics, I've been a be beneficiary of Title IX. But I want to go back 50 years ago when Senator Birch by championed Title IX and actually drafted the legislation, or drafted the language for the federal legislation. And he said at the time, one of the great failings of the American educational system was its unjustified discrimination against women. And he saw the ripple effects of that discrimination, how it impacted all facets of life, from access to jobs to financial, to financial security. And over the years, though, Title IX the, and its impact has come to mean many things to many different people. And I'm just curious, and this is where I want to kick it off, what does it stand for? What does Title IX stand for in your mind? And also, what has been you know, the personal impact of Title IX on your life? So the ripple effects in a personal way. Um, I thought I'd throw that out to the whole panel. And maybe, Miguel, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, you know, glad to be here. Glad to be uh, part of this amazing panel. And that's probably one of the most important laws out there. Um, you know, I've been in education over two decades, and I can't think of another law that's as important as this one. Um, you know, it, it stands for opportunities. Opportunities. It, that, that's, that's how basic it is. Opportunities for, for our, all of our students. The, they, they have the same opportunities as others to engage in, whether it's sports. And, and it's not just sports, too. It's, you know, scholarship opportunities and STEM fields. So it's opportunity, it opens doors for students to, to look at the potential that's out there and, and know that that's there for them. You know, and in my experience, starting as a fourth grade teacher, school principal, district leader, uh, commissioner, and now secretary, I've seen students really find themselves, find their passions, and, and be able to follow those passions because of Title IX. Um, you know, as a father, I, I got a, I got a sophomore at home, who, uh, Celine, who I saw so much growth in her um, as a, a young athlete. And um, the skills that she developed, I, I believe, are really going to influence how she, what she does, how, what, what she chooses to do for the rest of her life. So as an educator and as a parent, I can tell you um, firsthand I've seen tremendous impact in opportunities and opening doors for our students. I also heard you you know, try not to miss a game yeah. that your daughter plays in. And just from that perspective, as a father, as a dad, the support and the supporting women in athletics. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I said before, you know, I was in Vegas last week or two weeks ago, and I was talking to students who, I, we were talking about the pandemic and what it meant and how coming back, how important it was. And without question, each of the students said that their engagement in co-curricular activities, and I say co-curricular, not extra curricular, they're co-curricular, were more of an influencer for them to want to be back to school. That sense of uh, family that they have with their teams um, and their personal growth uh, because of athletics. So Title IX is, is it's really about developing our youngsters into who they're going to be when they grow up. Yeah. More of the impact of Title IX, how you see it as a professional, as AG, but also obviously personal impact because you played college and professional basketball. Well, we can't talk about that when I'm up here on a stage. <laughs> can't? <laughs> I had a little detour, yeah. Um, all right, the professional. I mean, this is a law. It is the first law that bans discrimination based on sex. So that is a big deal. And if you go back to 72, at the time, schools were allocating only 1% of their budgets on women's sports. Women were getting, in the academic arena, maybe 7 or 9% of all degrees in law. 
in medicine, for example. As a result of Title IX, so much has changed. And huge credit to the athletes, yeah. uh, to the coaches, and to others who went, you know, so we can talk a lot about this because a lot has, has happened over the last 50 years and more needs to happen. But it is very significant because it is the first law that actually bans discrimination based on sex. For me personally, I wouldn't be here today were it not for Title IX because um, I had opportunities to play, particularly in college. Growing up as a kid, I was generally the only girl on the team. It was all boys for the various sports I played. But I think through high school and through college, more and more was available for girls and women. And through sports, I learned, obviously, the, the, the power of leadership and teamwork and discipline and failure and resilience and adversity. And I think for women in particular, the studies show that more and more women rise to the levels of the C-suite, C-suite rise to levels of political leadership, uh, just by way of example. Um, the more they are college athletes, actually, there's a correlation there. So sports is big time, big time important to me personally. Lori, I'll toss the question over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, the entire foundation is both mirrored off of what they've said. It's that it sounds obvious, but discrimination is not okay, especially between sexes. So the idea of equality between sports, especially for women to come up and to show all the things that they've worked hard for. I mean, we can vouch that it takes time, it takes energy. Um, so to have that representation out there, and especially for me as a kid growing up and seeing female athletes, it made sure that I never once had a question if I could do it or not. So that was, that was my biggest takeaway. And I think personally, a little tough because I was homeschooled you know, from third grade all the way up until I graduated high school, but I've seen what it's done for my teammates especially those who have gone and done college gymnastics and the opportunities that they get are just tenfold. So it, it's important, you know, everybody gets to be seen. Mm. Yeah, very similar. I think it represents in my life opportunity. And the story that I like to tell about Title IX is just that I really didn't know what it was. And that's actually a compliment to it um, mm -hmm. because I had chances to play. I had teams available to me, um, you know, both growing up through high school, college, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the good of it is that I am a direct beneficiary of the fact that this was passed in the 70s. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So it's, 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 a, it's a good sign. At the same time, the fact that we need to have it at all <laughs> is you know, the frustrating part. The fact that we need to defend it at all now is the frustrating part. So I can kind of see, or I've kind of lived both sides of that. Got it. Now I want to just sort of uh, level set here and give a little bit of background on Title IX because in 1972 when President Nixon signed the legislation it actually didn't mention athletics um, in the original wording so I'm curious Maura can you talk a little bit about the original intent of Title IX and specifically how it came to be so closely associated or why it became so closely associated with women's athletics yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, 37 words, never mentions sports, never mentions athletics. Um, but it, it, it came about as a result of a lot of advocacy and an effort coming through the 60s and a recognition that, wait, it is really not acceptable that women are so underrepresented in um, academia, in, in uh, degrees, um, and yes, also in sports. But, you know, it, it, it's... I, why, why is it so associated with sports? Um, again, I credit, I credit the fearlessness and the advocacy of the women who came well before me, I too am the beneficiary, who were willing to stand up, the coaches, the players, who were willing to stand up and make this an issue, make this an issue about gym time and uniforms and you know basic budgets. Um, and I think that's, you know, a credit to the athletes um, and those in the arena for making this, uh, making this um, so pronounced and, and, and really important because, you know, sports give us a lot in life, a lot of foundational stuff that is really, really critical. And um, I'm so grateful for those who, who really took, took up the torch. Now, Miguel, I'm curious uh, for the Department of Education, how do you quantify the importance uh, of access to sports for all students from an educational standpoint. Um, 
How does that, how, does, it, how do you quantify it, The fact that we're even asking that in 2022 is a little, you know, it kind of, as my kids would say, cringeworthy. Uh, <laughs> but it needs to be asked. It does, it does. Uh, the fact that we have to talk about equal access and put in systems to ensure that disproportionality is addressed speaks to the fact that we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, it may not be as overt, but it's still there. Um, we, see, we see examples of it every once in a while. A story will come out where they'll show a picture of one, um, you know, a weightlifting room for one team and a weightlifting room for another team. And it's a reminder that we're not where we need to be yet. So for me, it's about promoting a culture of equity in our schools, uh, of access, so that every child that walks through a, a schoolhouse door knows that that building is there, that the, the community is there to help them meet their goals. Um, and as I said before, it goes beyond sports. This is really about personal development. When, when those students looked me in the eye last week and said, if it weren't for my team, I wouldn't feel as well as I feel. I wouldn't feel as connected. I wouldn't want to achieve those goals that I have, whether it's in sports or not. This is my second family. I was at a, at a school in Indiana and I heard a student tell me, freshman, who the pandemic disrupted eighth grade. So this kid is now a sophomore in a school where he stepped foot in that school the first time this year. Freshman year was on you know, the computer. And he said, if it weren't for my team, I don't know that I would want to be here. I wouldn't be succeeding. So we need to recognize that athletics do more than just provide physical fitness or activity. It's really about uh, someone's personal development. So for me, it goes down to the basic fundamental reason we exist as an education institution, to make sure we're bringing out the potential that the students have and letting them explore what interests them. And to have uh, such dispari uh, disparities um, today it is still an area that we want to elevate. We want to make sure that we're not just having folks follow Title IX because it's the law, but because it's the right thing to do. We want to create the cultural shifts that, that in some parts of our country, as I was saying in the back room, seem to be worse now than before, two, three years ago. So um, it, it, it really is, for me, a fundamental guiding principle that should lead the work of education and lead the work of educational leaders across the country. I want to turn a little bit to the athlete perspective and, and jump off of something that Miguel said. He said there's still work to do, still a lot of work to do. And I'm wondering from an, an athlete perspective, where do you see the most work needing to be done? Um, and with that, Miguel also mentioned the fact that, you know, two different weight rooms, obviously referring to what happened last March during the men's and women's NCAA basketball tournament, where we also, thanks to Sedona Prince, that uh, one of the weight rooms was just wholly inadequate. Um, and the men's uh, was all decked out. So still work to do where? Where, where should priorities be? <clears throat> priorities. Um, I mean, <laughs> I make that face because it's like everywhere. Yeah. I don't even know. You know, it depends on the day you ask me how I feel about this, what, what avenue. I mean, whenever we talk about women's sports, I mean, Maury just mentioned something about like 1% of women, you know, at one point we're receiving. Everything's in like the single, single digits of percentage. It's like we get 4% of the media coverage. We get, I don't even know, 6% of the corporate sponsorship. It's like it's always in the 1%. And I think, I, I don't really know that I have an exact answer. I think what frustrates me the most is, in my experience, if a woman, if a, woman, if a female athlete or a, a team, in order for them to be treated in a way that the men are treated, they have to achieve this like right. amazing amount of success. They have to be this total outlier and kill it in all the ways in order to get that. But for men's teams, for, for male athletes, they just have to show up and they get treated a certain way and they get, you know, they have the luxury of certain facilities or, you know, you mentioned the NCAA tournament. And that to me is, is always an issue. And then even when the, the woman or the, or the team has the success, the focus still somehow is like on all the things the one or two things they're not doing or the one or two ways in which they're not successful. And yet the men, they don't have to be great. They can still just show up. So that to me is, is something that is really frustrating. 
So it seems that cultural piece that keeps coming up, the need for some cultural change mm -hmm. in the way we value women and women athletes. Lori. Yeah, I think my biggest point of view is media coverage. Mm. <laughs> it's pretty explanatory. Go there, so. go there. The 4% four, the four that Sue mentioned, right? Yeah, it's just, it's simply flat out just not fair. And a, a good quote that my friend Deanna said was, how can you be a fan of something you don't see? Mm. So, you know, I think coverage for women should be just as much. And it's an interesting position for me because gymnastics is pre like predominantly a female run sport. And so that's where also it's like, okay, we need to make sure that it is equal. That is essentially what Title IX is going for. But at the same time, coverage is important. Media is everything nowadays. Social media is everything nowadays. Everybody has a phone. Everybody is able to kind of check in and see what's going on in the world. And you know, if the media coverage isn't equal, especially when it comes to sports like basketball and baseball, you know, I just don't think we see enough of that. So maybe we'll stay on social media just for a moment here, because it seems interesting to me how much female athletes have mobilized fan bases and have used that to tell their personal stories and to create a platform and an avenue when the perhaps platform and avenue of mainstream media is a bit blocked or that's limited for them. So I'd, I'd like to hear if anyone who wants to chime in on this, but it seems athlete oriented, but the role in, of social media is c continuing to play in women's sports and the, the way in which female athletes are using that to you know, empower them and to empower um, their fans, quite frankly. See it a lot in the WNBA. Yeah, um, no, social media is huge for, for women's athletes right now because, I mean, you basically said it, we don't get the coverage in other ways but now we have a chance to have our own platforms, to use those to, whether it's you wanna show somebody the cool outfit you're wearing or you wanna talk about activism and get you know, the things that are important to you out into the world. Um, you can also, again, you said the WNBA, mobilize in a way where it's uniform and then, then it's like even more powerful mm -hmm. when you have you know, 100 plus people doing it at the same time. Um, but it's been crucial to, I think, again, specific to basketball, the change we've seen in the last couple of years. Social media has played a huge role because we actually have control over that. We can now use that to, again, get messages out there because we're not getting the coverage. We're just not. It's really that simple. And it's, it's really that sad. I, I love yeah. how this is being used because you're literally cutting out the middleman. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're going around a system that's not designed equitably either, as, as you mentioned. So you take it upon yourself to show, and you have a control over that. So I love I loved to see that. I, I love to see how that's getting more attention, and, and that's, uh, people are noticing that. Yeah, and we can use it to call things out, yeah. right? Like things happen, we never really had that voice, that microphone, and now so whatever the case, obviously Sedona Prince and the NCAA tournament is just an amazing example, because we all know it, mm -hmm. and it's like, it was so mm -hmm. just in your face. Um, but had she not had TikTok, mm -hmm. We never would have seen that. And then, of course, it, it makes you, you know, realize, oh, this has been happening. We just never saw it. And there was no way to get the attention. So it's, been, it's really been everything. Lori, do you have anything you want to add on the subject matter, the power of social media for women athletes? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I know, especially in the gymnastics world, social media has played a huge role in the things that we're seeing and the coverage that we're getting, especially with everything that's happened with the sport within the last decade or so and within the last few years, um, that is a, a case, you know, that essentially everyone knows about. And it's because of social media it's being talked about. And granted, with that and a, a story of an old coach that I've had, you know, it was emotional and verbal abuse. And through social media, that was something that was talked about. It was getting thousands of comments of feedback. Hey, I went through the same thing. And because of social media, we're able to spread the word, you know, not just about what's not happening, and especially because of TikTok. Man, TikTok is such a world. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a place. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But social media, it allows for speaking up about not getting enough coverage about the inequalities of the world, but especially in sport, and then now also on the platform and the scale of social media. I mean, uh, on the scale of mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something that's very right. important. Right. And because they're not going to give themselves the credit they're due. You know, I spend my time, Attorney General, we bring cases, investigations, you're trying to change things, right, it's through action. Nothing can have an effect similar to the effect that 
these folks have had using their social media platforms for good. And if you think about the issues of our time, who has it been speaking out on issues of sexual violence, sexual harassment, mental health, racial justice, no. gender equity, female athletes, right? You, we can call up these examples just in the last two, three years. And that platform is so powerful. And it's just, these, this is why we have Title IX. This is what it empowers, right? This is why we need to support. Look at the leadership that comes. And again, I really credit women athletes in particular for using their voice to go back to the point about the disparities. It is also terrible uh, and really shameful and needs to be addressed that so much of the burden is on women right. athletes, women coaches, you know, in how many collegiate programs are the women coaches and women athletes being asked to do more in terms of marketing yep. and promotion, right? If you build it, they will come. But if you don't show it, how are, how are people going to know? So I think there needs to be a much greater alignment of priorities around equity, and that means a big infusion of investment and attention when it comes to marketing, because it's not fair that so much of the burden resides on, on women athletes in, in sport. You know, through social media, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> through social media, they call themselves beneficiaries of it. I would argue, you know, you didn't know what Title IX was. Most um, girl athletes don't, but they do know that you stand for something. And they see you're using your, your influence to promote things that are going to help them. So, in essence, you're... I look at what you're doing and what um, women athletes do as the, the true embodiment of what Title IX is, empowering. And I, I'll be honest with you, you know, I have a 15-year-old. She's paying attention to the social media posts that are being put, not to the regulation that lives that's 50 years old. So I don't think you're giving yourselves enough credit for what you're doing to enhance the messaging and provide synergy behind what can be done and I think through social media and through the leadership we're going to get further faster because of the leaders that are using their social media and their influence to push it along but I'd like to see it not be as you said just the women athletes I think we need to do better and we need to shift the culture in our institutions to make sure that everybody's talking about it I also feel like you know Title IX was created because you know women weren't being talked about or being inserted into the picture and it would be so helpful if everybody spoke up about it. And it's predominantly women because we're most affected by it. But if everybody joins in, you know, if we're already creating such a big movement, how wild would it be if it was everyone, if it was both men and women and everyone in between? Like, I think that would just start a pretty big fire. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see that. <laughs> it, it's true. And I, I mean, I don't want to keep going on this, but your point is well taken. Boys need to see this. Yes, yeah. This is not just about my daughter. This is about my son yeah. seeing this. This is about um, our institution leaders, those in, who have positions of influence to see this, almost more so. You know, I feel the same way about supporting our transgender athletes. We all need to be standing up for injustices that are so blatant right now. Um, and, and I think your point is one that we don't talk about enough, but we should be talking about. That it's everyone's issue, not just girls and women. So I'm just curious, it's everyone's issues. What do we do? I mean, get, are there steps that we can take? We know that we, we've identified the issue, but how do we fix it? Are there things that we can do you know, to get more involvement, to change the culture, to flip a switch? somehow, what, what are steps that we all can take? Not just the athletes and not just the female athletes, but all of us, journalists included. <laughs> Let's hear from you guys first. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the first word that comes to mind is obviously allyship and like what that means. Um, so just to be able to have more allies, but I actually think the secretary brought it up best and it's something that I talk a, a lot about now. Yes, when we go into rooms and we're speaking to kids, it's like, you want to empower the little girls in the room, right? And you want them to have the see it, be it moment. You want to be able yeah. to give them that. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm looking at you boys. Yep. I'm looking at the boys. And I'm like, they also need to see, 
these women in these positions, not just athletes, but you know, whatever the case may be, because it's like if the if the little girls are having to see it be it, I think the little boys are having like a see it respect it or something happening to them. <laughs> you know, where they're and it becomes very normal and natural for them to see a professional women's basketball player. And that's just the norm. And I think what I find is, you know, when I come across a certain age group, probably like in the twenties, thirties, it's just the tendency is to hate on women's athletes. And I think they just grew up not having it, not seeing it, not knowing it. Um, so it's just, that's like, I don't know why that's like the default. Mm. Like they need to check in with that. That speaks that says more, <laughs> more about them. That's like somehow the default in this. But I do think like putting an emphasis on teaching young boys is, is really crucial to all of this. That's huge. The default is to hate yes. on female athletes. No. Literally, you, you'll bring one up in conversation and the first thing is like, oh, well, you want to know all the things she hasn't done? Yeah, or I could take her. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I could do it. It's like, but did you? Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about her. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she did it. Um, but yeah, to join in, it would just be the conversation being had with everyone involved. I do feel like that's why this panel is so important because we're sharing the experience and you're, you're also a part of the secretary. Like we're, yeah. we're joining in on all of this and it's the conversation, but allyship is so important. Being active about allyship, talking about it, especially on social media and seeing that, especially from male athletes. That's, that's something that we could really use because we're, we're doing a lot. We are. <laughs> it, and I agree with everything. And one of the things I observe, so like I'm old now, um, and you know, we're done, we're still playing in our like senior basketball leagues, but a lot of us, a lot of my friends have kids who play, right? It's amazing to me how many girls sports teams are coached by men and how there are no very few women coaching boys and so if you ask like what we can do on the local level how can we get you know more women coaching more women coaching boys more women coaching girls that's that's one thing and you know it sometimes is just the case that women okay are busy sort of running a household maintaining a job and you know dealing with dinner and homework and everything and even though they were college athletes are not the ones coaching. It's the, the husband who, you know, maybe played some junior high ball, JV high school, right? Out there, yeah, honestly. So I think some more like engagement that way is important. And then money matters, right? Money matters. And this is such a wonderful conference of so many stakeholders. I would just implore you all to think about the actual dollars, where they're going in terms of the investment. Because if it's at 4%, mm -hmm. think about what you could do if you three times, four times that, right? You're not even at 50. But imagine what you could do. And that's the kind of intentionality and engagement that we mean, uh, that we need. Um, we shouldn't have to wait for litigation. We shouldn't have to wait for lawsuits to bring this kind of change. And, and you know, I think that, um, I, I think those are just some, some things. Yeah, <laughs> well said. And, you know, it's, Athletes of this caliber having to talk about the deficit mentality around women's sports, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. But you're identifying what still exists today. So when you ask, what can we do about it? For me, there's a two-prong approach, support and accountability. I always say they have to be equal. Support and accountability. Uh, the accountability, OCR, we're going we're gonna to go after anything and we're going to take it seriously and, we're, you know, we're going to investigate and we're going to make sure that uh, the laws are followed. But it's really also about creating the capacity to change that culture, to ensure that we have hiring practices that put people in positions of authority um, that lead with that equity so they don't have to have the threat of a, 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 an investigation to make the right decision. It's shifting that culture in our country that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so. What can we do? We can lift up examples of where it's working. We can promote capacity building around equity um, to make sure that the decisions are being made naturally because they, they want to do it, not because somebody's watching over them. I, I think that's the thing. We want it to be intrinsic. I, I was in a cabinet meeting yesterday and the president, um, it was amazing, you know, we're, we're around the table and the president took a moment to say, this cabinet looks like America. 
there were uh, 11 men, uh, 10 women, um, you know, obviously the president, vice president, and the, the backgrounds in the room, uh, it was something that we noticed and it was a moment. It was a moment yesterday. I think we need to do more of that to acknowledge where it's working, why it's working, and the intentionality behind why it's working, um, not just enforcing. I think the enforcing comes almost after the fact. You want to create the right culture, the right behavior, you want to hire well, so that you have people whose mentality and intrinsic motivation is to make sure that you're doing what's right because it's the right thing to do and, and promoting equality in all, in all the decisions that are made, whether it's funding, uh, you know, facilities, or whatever, who's, who we're hiring to, 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 to coach. Those decisions have to be made by someone that really believes it. I think that's our responsibility to make sure we're putting the right people in the right positions. I also think, though, we have to be, we have to be, we have to acknowledge that a system that relies on self-reporting, just mm. like, that's not gonna work. And so I appreciate the transparency and the push for transparency. And so, for example, you know, with respect to colleges and universities or the high schools, whether you're on the board, whether you're an overseer, you know, ask the questions and push what is your entity doing with respect to transparency in the real numbers? Because for far too long, far too many have had to fight for transparency. And for coaches who ask those questions, they should not be penalized. They should not be penalized. And there have been too many instances, I think, where women coaches are penalized for asking those questions as we speak today. So I think, I think that, um, you know, that, that's an issue. Um, self-reporting is an issue and a system that relies on self-reporting is an issue and you know need more need more i'm in the hammer camp too for a reason because um self-reporting doesn't always result in what you want in terms of the important culture change which is absolutely essential yeah i'm wondering it seems like culture change and enforcement are inextricably tied together right because the mechanism for enforcement is the self-reporting, and you mentioned OCR, just as, as some background here. Institutions are responsible, so that self-reporting part, for complying with federal laws, and again, they self-report whether they are in compliance with Title IX, but the OCR, Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education, is there to enforce it. Right. And so I'm wondering, does the, enforce, the mechanism for enforcement have to change to prompt the culture change? It's not like, it's a bit of a chicken and egg, sort of, which do you do first? How do you tackle that? And I was gonna well, say. This is above my pay grade. <laughs> well, I turned 22 point. in June, so. <laughs> hey, they're the athletes. They know, they live yeah. this experience, so I don't even wanna speak. I will say this, though, that if you ask an athletic director if you ask an athletic director, over 50% of them would tell you they don't know who their legally required Title IX coordinator is. Okay, so like that is a problem. Um, and Shira, I forget your question, but o o o OCR. OCR and this the, the self-reporting and how yeah, and, you know what why, comes first. I mean, um, and, and I would say, you know, I've been a civil rights lawyer for a long time now. I used to run the civil rights division here. Worked a lot with the Department of Ed over the years. We don't have the capacity or resources, given the number of institutions right. and schools, to credibly tell you that that is going to be a vehicle to make change, right? So um, that's why I think more, more advocacy and push within institutions is, is going to be really important if we're going to change what needs changing. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, and I'm thinking about other accountability systems and you know, there has to be a, a mix of internal and external, right? Um, but that's why I'm inspired by how social media has created a grassroots, bottom-up accountability system that we need to pay attention to. And yes, OCR is there and we take the investigations, but we need everyone to be paying attention to this and everyone to be an ally on this. Um, I think, you know, having external accountability partners um, that exists out there are important too, so that folks know that you know we are watching this. We should be disaggregating data. We should be putting it out there. You know, we're at an, at an, at an analytics conference. We should be looking at that. Just like throughout my career, we've been disaggregating achievement data based on race and place. Why why wouldn't we be doing this in athletics around access? Because we know it it 
I said, I spent the first part of this conversation talking about this is more than just sports. This is about children feeling that they can achieve, finding goals and achieving their goals, and then ending up in the, in the C-suite, right? So this is really, uh, I think we need a new level of accountability that's external, that works with, that lifts up those examples, um, internal and external. But I do think part of it is also in the capacity building, ensuring that we're hiring the right people that believe this, that get this, in the top positions so that we're not having to find uh, where, where they messed up to uh, fix the problem. That to me is, is it's almost too late, damage was done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can comment on it. I think, um, so recently, um, as in literally the last couple of days, an article came out on Sports Illustrated about WNBA and charter flights. And I'm actually, it's not even about getting in the weeds on, you know, did, were the charter flights offered? Did the league say no? Like there's, this, there's two sides to this. It's not even about that. But the, the beauty of that article, and actually a WNBA article came out yesterday, or an article about the WNBA and Kathy, our commissioner, was able to speak and kind of do her own little fact check. Um, but what's interesting is that article, whether it's true or not, is enough to now charter flights are like in the conversation. So in the room, right, like you obviously have this amazing cabinet room where it's like diverse and you've got all these voices. You realize, A, how important that is to have different perspectives in that room. But also now, whether we, have, whether, whether we get charter flights tomorrow or five years or 10 years or 15, it's now a conversation in that room because of one article. Right. And it'll always be in that conversation now. So that to me is where I find younger athletes are like killing it. Yeah. Cause I feel like I have a little bit of like PTSD of like, just be thankful that you even yeah. have a chance to play. I fight that almost daily, but my younger teammates, they're like, nah, what's up with the charter flight? You know, like they just want charter flights. They don't care. And I'm like, well, the economics, <laughs> that's, that's like the PTSD in me, you know, but they like fight. And then an article comes out and now it's a conversation and that's how change. And that's just one example. I could probably, we could probably all pull like numerous examples. So to me, it's about sometimes you just got to like get it out there, whether it's social media or a proper article for the change to, for people to realize they need to change. It like forces the hand. Mm -hmm. I think one other thing that's come into the conversation, and Lori, um, I know you wanted to speak about, mental health has come mm -hmm. into the conversation. That's an important aspect of what women athletes have brought um, onto social media and elsewhere. So it's another great example. One of the examples I think you're, you're alluding to, Sue. So. Yeah, I mean, even just separately, mental health in sports, from my experience, was not something that was prominent or talked about or any of the things. My mom is a social worker, so I grew up with lots of feelings in the house. It was really great, you guys. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was always taught that the mind and body are two beautiful and wonderful things, and both need to be treated equally. Both are just as important, and if you lack one, the balance is just not right, and things will kind of go wrong there. Mm -hmm. um, sports psychology was not involved in our program from my understanding. There was not really, especially in the era of gymnastics that I was in, things were very strict. They had like a very cutthroat program. We would go to this training camp for five days, once a month, every month, until meet season, and it was just this entire program that they built. Um, you didn't want to show that you wanted to talk about that because as soon as you talk about that, then you're not strong enough to just handle it on your own and then you're out and they look at somebody else who doesn't want to talk about it. So it's like that has started to change a bit. So I hope, fingers crossed, and I've noticed some little things, but in the era of gymnastics that I was in, you know, as a kid who had a lot of anxiety growing up, especially getting ready for meet season and competitions and watching my teammates stand there and kind of, you know, take a deep breath, shake it out, and then there's me crying in the corner, getting ready to compete. Um, how wonderful would it have been if there was someone there who I was allowed to talk to and say, hey, I'm having these feelings. It doesn't mean that I'm weak. It doesn't mean that I can't keep up. It just, my performance would grow so much better if I knew how to handle this. Mm -hmm. And I wish that that was implemented, not just in gymnastics, but in all sports and for all sexes. There are lots of things going on, especially post-pandemic. Um, and especially within the sports world and the education world, just as you mentioned, you know, it's so important for these kids and these teenagers to show up to school and their biggest thing is community and teamwork. And that is something that people thrive on, especially when you have a team that is like brothers and sisters and siblings, you know, 
that is stronger than most things that we've ever, th ever seen. We're, we're all stronger when we work together and the kids pick up on that before anything else, you know? So I just, I wish that that was implemented more. I wish the conversation was a little bit bigger because something that I struggled with a lot growing up and I know I'm not the only one, I just know that other people are a little too scared to talk about that. So. Yeah. So we've talked about a few issues that have come into the conversation, starting with charter flights, mental health, um, jumping, pivoting to mental health. Um, but also, I think one, another recent bit of news in women's sports was the fact that the pay discrimination lawsuit filed by the U.S. women's national team in soccer was settled for $24 million. And yes, applause for that. And as part of that settlement, there's going to be, um, there will be equal pay between the women's and men's national team moving forward. And that's for friendlies, for tournaments, um, and World Cup play. And I'm wondering, one, how big a victory is this? Because it seems like an awfully big victory. But how do you think this victory, this settlement, changes the way women's sports is viewed and valued? Um, so I think that's a, a question for both Athletes, former athletes. Um, Want to be athletes. Want to be athletes. <clears throat> Talked before about how you wanted to be Jerry Rice. I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how has that changed you know, the conversation in terms of, around equal pay? I think Sue mentioned earlier how you know, female athletes, we have to do so much just to be recognized just as much as the men who show up. <laughs> That's not really fair, don't you think? I think we do just as incredible things. If not, now we have to do more just to be seen. Right. And it's this is a huge victory. I am not undermining that. It's just um, in an era of 2022, when we're talking about Title IX and how it was done 50 years ago, we're also still fighting for equality. And that's that's very prominent today. So that's there's a bit of a chuckle. They had to be wildly successful yeah. just yeah. to yeah. get a lawsuit done, like wildly successful. They had to win everything. They had to do it the right way. They had to like present, not present, but like represent in a certain way just to get like people in the room and listen to them. And so I, that's just beyond frustrating. But I think this, what the settlement does is, and Megan said this in, in, her, in her day of press conferences, like, Everybody wins. I win, you win, we all win. Everybody in this room wins. All, all you know, little girls who are gonna grow up and become whatever athlete they become, soccer players, basketball players, they win. And it's really for them. Like, yeah, it's a little extra money in everybody's pocket that, that played on the national team that they are more than deserving of. But the reality is it's really gonna help the next generation. That's kind of like all the work we're doing now, it's always kind of for the benefit of the next generation. But it's, it's, it was crucial, it's, it's incredibly important. It's going to change how people view things, what, what, they, what they, maybe what someone, a federation like U.S. soccer, what they'll now, how they'll approach it, what people around them will allow them to do or not allow them to do. It's going to change the whole mindset of it all. Yeah, it's, I think it, another degree of accountability mm -hmm. for those organizations that run um, sports federations, sports, national sports teams. Um, also, it strikes me. The win did not have to just come on the field. They had to win over public opinion yeah. in a big way to change the culture. I mean, really change the culture and change the conversation. I don't know if Miguel or Mora, you want to comment on the significance going forward mm -hmm. of this settlement. Um, I, well, I think it's, it's hugely significant, and I hope it is um, a jumping off point. I think it is you know, it, it's frustrating that it had to take so much to get to this point, but I think it shows how intractable some of these forces are and the work that we need to do. You know, we're going into, we're going into March Madness. This is the first time, right, Sue, when you played, one called March Madness for women, right? What do they call it, the Women's Final Four? Yeah. The NCAA tournament? Yeah, All right. I never got there, so. <laughs> so this year, first time, March Madness. Why is that happening? It's happening because a woman basketball player took a video last year in facilities, right? Mm -hmm. That's why this is happening. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't wait for those moments to precipitate the change. So huge credit to women's soccer players for their advocacy and for Megan's leadership. And yes, let this be, you know, a shift in, in 
in mindset, hopefully, going forward, a shift in expectation going forward, that we're not going to tolerate what has been. We've just established a new ground game and level set. And here we go. And people need to continue to press, press on that. Hopefully, it won't be so hard the next time. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's monumental. Uh, I think it's monumental um, for a couple reasons. You know, it, it shows for girls and boys, your voice matters. You believe in something, fight for it. So the, the, the settlement, the, the pay, that's great. But we believe in something, we're gonna fight for it. That's what resonates for me as an educator. Look it, they believed in something, they fought for something, and look. That's number one. And number two, that conversation about that charter plane, maybe wouldn't have happened had it not been for that. Mm -hmm. So the next generation is looking at it like, no, I expect it now. Mm -hmm. Where you even said, you know, we're, we're like, well, you know, things are incremental. No, the, the next generation is like, no, we, we need to move faster. Mm -hmm. So I think what it did was not only address the, the lawsuit, and I think it showed voice matters, and if you believe in something, you fight for it. That's number one. And number two, it really sets its stage for the next generation to take it to that next level. And um, I think we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one thing? Mm -hmm. I think the thing, like obviously I experienced it in this like behind, you sure. know, I got to pull back the curtain in a lot of ways. I think the most fascinating thing when the settlement got done was in conversation with just friends, like my guy friends, it was kind of like, oh, like is this a good thing, you know? And it was like, well, what do you mean? You know, and, and it was just interesting to hear the male perspective because it was one of, they're like, oh, they didn't just get the same prize money? Like, oh, they just didn't get, like, why? I guess a male's perspective was they played a sport and they won. Why wouldn't it be equal? Which is, I guess, a great thing, but it also showed, like, oh, you don't know. Yeah. Like, oh, because your walk of life is you do get the opportunity. You do get equal pay. You do get, yeah. So it's like, oh, you just don't know what this is like over here. So what also makes that settlement so important is now it's like it was blasted. Everybody yeah. knows about it. And so now, like, you know, like my friend, you know, Joe, he's gonna read that and now Joe's gonna know. Mm -hmm. Joe's gonna see it and know. And maybe that's a conversation that changes in his own household. So that I think was like an amazing byproduct. Mm -hmm. Some people just like, I mean, you can argue that they need to know and it's their fault for not knowing. I'm in that, I'm in that camp as well. But some people just like genuinely don't realize the discrepancies in our world between men and women. And you could argue that Joe might have known if the media coverage had been better. And here and we are, back more, to that. I was going to say, exactly, and more consistent right. um, over time. With Joe's not really a person. I just made it up. Yes. <laughs> he Joe. has a name, but I'm not going to call Joe. him. Joe. Um, you Miguel, you were talking a lot about the next generation. So I want to sort of he head the conversation there as we wrap up in the final minutes. Um, of this panel. And you know, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of guidance, regulation changes, and amendments <clears> to <throat> Title IX. Um, there's some updating going on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping you can give us some, a, a status update on the updating and, and I, yeah, on, of Title IX. And I, I am aware that you can't get into specifics, but what can you tell us about the updating? You know, even after this conversation, it's just a good reminder how much more we have to do. Um, you know, in terms of the, where we are, we, we went through the process of listening and um, we're, we're hopeful to have some proposed rulemaking um, in the spring. You know, we, we mentioned April, that's what we're shooting for. Um, and while I can't get into the specifics, what I will tell you is that we, the issues are still out there. Sometimes it's, it's, it's harder to see them because they're not in your face. So that doesn't mean that they're not happening and that we, we don't have to set up systems to address them or to look for them. Um, I mentioned it before, and I, I wanna mention it again. I feel post-pandemic, there are certain students who are being discriminated against blatantly, publicly, and we need Title IX to evolve to make sure we're caring for all students. All means all, that's the bottom line. So it, it has to be it has to evolve, and the process that we're taking, we're really proud of. It's one that brings in feedback from the field and um, from, from various stakeholders. Uh, it's a lengthy process because it's thorough, and, and it has to be. And as I said, in the spring, we're, we're hoping to have uh, proposed um, regulations to, to have comment on. Um, and you know, we want to move quickly on it, but we want to do the process right and listen first. 
Now I want to turn. Well, I know the attorney. My attorneys in the in the audience right now are like breathing a little. Okay, good. You didn't say. Got through because that. we're through the. You know, we're, we're in, it's it's open right now, so I can't really comment too much on it. I, I want to respect the process, but I'll tell you right now, there's a reason why I'm here, and there's a reason why, as a secretary of education, I want to take opportunities to say how important for me and my role to mean to say all means all, and to make sure that the policies um, support all students and. and 50 million K, pre-K-12 students and the 17 million that are going to higher ed, we have a responsibility to make sure we're protecting all students. So the message is stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Things are happening. Things are moving. Things are moving. Um, Sue, you're, I'm going to turn now as we look next gen and forward. You're entering your last WNBA season. Perhaps. Perhaps. Oh, I like ah, perhaps. I love it. I love it. Ooh. That's, that's the news that comes out of this panel. I'm going to mess with Perhaps. everyone all year. <laughs> um, that's going to be fun. <laughs> um, what legacy do you hope you, your career leaves for that next generation we're talking about? Yeah, um, I think for a long time I was so focused on winning and just like the basketball elements of, of a legacy, like being a champion and being known as a winner and all those things. And it was in part of just getting older right? Um, and in the last couple of years, kind of seeing, you know, what's so interesting about women's sports is, because like it's been talked about, Title IX is not just about sports, yet somehow sports gets pushed. And it's because of a lot of reasons. One of them is we have media asking us questions. We have microphones in our face. So we're able to speak on these things and kind of represent everybody. And I think sports mirrors society. So it's like, to me, if you're female athletes, in, in this country are able to succeed, whether it's individual sports, team sports, leagues, that's gonna, that's gonna trickle into like all areas because people are gonna see it. And so when I think about legacy and I think about the work we're doing in the WNBA, and like I said, I got really hung up on, on just the basketball part for a large part of my career. And it's actually Kobe Bryant who said at one point, he, he eventually, he started to see like, there's gonna, like, so for me, like, there's gonna be another great point guard. Like there's, I have the assist record, somebody's going to break that record, right? Somebody's going to win more champion, championships than me. Somebody's going to do things you know, better. That's just how sports works. So it's like, okay, so if there's gonna be others that do that, like what else can I leave? And I think as you know, the elder statesman in the league, I've seen a lot, I've experienced a lot. And so now I really don't wanna pass up on opportunities to speak on things based on that experience because I know it'll set it up. For the next generation, I always joke: the second the first player signs a million-dollar deal in our league, like I know I will have played a role in that, and then I'll be like, "Dang, I never got a million. <laughs> that, that's going to be a good thing." Yeah. Like if I'm that disgruntled older athlete that we hear from nowadays, where it's like, "Well, I didn't get that, or I didn't fly charter," I hope I'm doing that because mm -hmm. that means I played a little role and it worked. Mm -hmm. And we're already starting to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're already starting to see some of those million dollar contracts in the NWSL with Trinity right. Rodman. Right. So there is progress being made. Now, Lori, a similar question. You're a children's book author, if I'm getting the title right. She's got this, right? Very similar question. <laughs> well, but, I mean, what, but I think in the sense that what is the message you hope, you know, to pass down to the next generation? Yeah, if anything, it's just that representation really matters. I know that's the entire point of this panel. <laughs> But representation matters. And I remember, you know, being a little kid and watching gymnastics and not seeing any Latinas out there and picking out the first girl who had curly hair like me and looking at my mom and saying, all right, she's my favorite. And mom was like, yeah, I know why. She looks like you. <laughs> and that was really all I needed. But even as a kid who wasn't going to school, it was my instinct to look for someone like me, to find community and to see someone who's done it before. Um, and, you know, for me, that was enough. But coming out with a children's book and having an illustrated little Hispanic girl who has these curls and you're getting these really young kids who are seeing that already. And if you can get that at a young age, imagine what they can do when they're not questioning if it's possible or not, because they've already seen it. So that's, that's why it's really important to me. I, I will firmly stand on the hill that representation is everything. So with the last few minutes of this panel, I want to ask everyone, this is the crystal ball moment. You know, what is your vision? You know, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary. We seem to have these conversations every five years. We should have them every year. But what is your vision for the next 50 years? What do you hope 
happens in women's sports? What do you hope happens with Title IX? And just a, a quick comment on what do you hope the future looks like? Oof. <laughs> so it's a big one, right? 50 years yeah. is a big chunk of time. But we'll, we'll go quick, and we should give you guys the last yeah. word. I would say this, when I turn on my TV set, instead of seeing 10 random men's NCAA games on for mediocre conferences, right? I wanna see women's hoop on, okay? Like, just, that's one thing. And when I walk into a gym, I wanna see women coaching boys. And going forward, I wanna see more little boys wearing Sue Bird basketball jerseys, because yep. they're wearing them now. But that's my vision. We went from, in 1972, about 300,000 high school uh, girl athletes. Uh, now we're at 2.6 million. So that's progress, but I want that to be dwarfed by the progress we make moving forward in the parity that Sue Bird so eloquently talked about. Mm -hmm. Lori, what do you have in mind for the next 50 years? Because you'll be, you'll be around to <laughs> see it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, honestly, I want not everybody to just support equality. I want them to be educated on it. Um, just as Sue had mentioned earlier, you know, your friend Joe. <laughs> Good old Joe. It's, Joe's getting a lot of publicity. Yeah. yeah. Shout out Joe. There you go. <laughs> Joe, we love you. Um, <laughs> wow. Our, our generation, especially Gen Z, we are raised with the intent that everyone should be equal. It's almost just an assumption. So when moments like this happen, especially with people like Joe, you know, <laughs> There's this automatic assumption, well, that's surprising you guys didn't get paid the same. You know, I just assumed you guys should be equal. And while that's wonderful and that is progress, had he known that we are still fighting for that, I think the conversation would have changed earlier, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, for everyone to understand, for everyone to be an ally, but for everyone to be educated on what's happening and what's not happening. Mm -hmm. so. I think very simply, I would love for women's sports to be looked at as a true investment and not some like charity work. Yeah. Like changing that, like that framework or that mindset, like it's an investment, um, we're not charity. And I get support us, don't get me wrong, I get that everyone has different reasons, but the sooner that happens, I think the sooner we'll start to see even more growth. I want a party like a Super Bowl party for a women's game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to be able to like, hey guys, come over. Time. We have this giant party that's happening. Oh, Sue yeah. Bird's playing. It's like, cool. It's cool. It's I'll probably. be uh, 90. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be at the party though. Yeah. Obviously. Obviously, you're invited. Obviously. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I want to thank the panelists, Miguel, Maura, Lori, Sue, for expanding the conversation. Um, and I hope this conversation continues on a more consistent basis. Um, and that we're talking about all the issues raised here regularly and loudly and on multiple platforms and that mainstream media joins in wholeheartedly. And I want to thank all of you for coming and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.